Hello and welcome to It'll Be Alright in the 90s, a podcast more stuck in the past than a packet of Merlin Premier League stickers. <laughs> I'm Alex and joining me as usual is my co-host Stu Jocelyn. How are you, Stu? Hi, mate. I'm uh, very well, thank you. And I have to say, uh, since our last episode with my dad, I have had a word with Jeff, uh, the show's lawyer. And oh, yeah. uh, he has advised me in since in the last episode when I was uh, telling a story about um, when I was sick in my parents' front garden. Uh, and as you pointed out at the time, drinking a pint at the same time, uh, he's yeah. advised me not to drink during the recordings anymore, just to protect my um, protect my character and my reputation. So, oh, okay. so thanks for that, Jeff. I shall be uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm totally liquid free in this room at the moment. So I can, there we go. Yeah. I can vouch for him, Jeff, because I I can see him on my screen. So uh, he's, <laughs> as I, as far as I can tell, he's got he's got no alcoholic beverages about this person. Well, thank um, you. With, with all your support, I can do this. <laughs> okay, so yeah, before we go any further, as usual, we'll 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 do our, our episode sponsor, and our sponsor for this episode is Hedgehog Crisps. Now, um, if you tweet at us, this is the first time we've done this for one of our sponsors. Oh, cool, um, cool. Uh, so if you tweet us and hashtag Hedgehog. We will send you a discount code for 20p off your next pack of Hedgehog Crisps. Um, I think the thing about Hedgehog Crisps is they're not always easy to find. I don't know about you, Stu, but I personally used to get them from the health food sort of deli shop that was next to Tong's in Corsham. Yes. The Methuen. Um, That's where I got mine from. Uh, But I I advise our listeners to go to health food shops or... um, delis that sort of place that's where you can find them um and yeah like i said you get 20p off if you uh send us that tweet uh hashtagging hedgehog that's only while uh stocks last of that i mean that's not going to go on forever so you know yeah i mean that's you want to do that pretty soon and uh so yeah that's that's our our sponsor for this week's uh episode uh courtesy of hedgehog foods and and just for legal reasons actually talking of jeff just for legal reasons, I do have to uh, state that hedgehog crisps are only hedgehog flavoured and don't actually contain any traces of real hedgehog. Right. Uh, that they have been in trouble before legally for that. Um, if you look at their Wikipedia page, so okay, just just make that very clear. Um, but yeah, I hedgehog crisps. I wouldn't imagine you would be able to get them from the shop next to Tongs in Caution anymore because it's a uh, Indian takeaway. So oh, maybe maybe the hedgehog crisps wouldn't wouldn't be wouldn't be in stock there. But uh, no. if you can find uh, find your other local stockists, uh, they'll be they'll be happy to give you that if you uh, shove them our code. So yeah, thanks very much to the guys at Hedgehog. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on to correspondence and the mailbag. You've got anything in the mailbag there, Stu? Yeah, got some correspondence here from regular uh, correspondent Alex Mitchell, who's written in about our new feature, What's the Most 90s, which we're obviously going to go back to shortly. Uh, Last time we discussed what the most 90s football club was, and I said that my shout was Wimbledon. He has gone back to my second shout of Coventry City, and he said that was a good shout. He heard somebody say, and he said, just look this up that Coventry City are the worst team to support in English football history. Uh, and since their promotion to the top flight in 1967, they've finished seventh or higher with a highest position of sixth only three times in their history. Uh, and their only major trophy remains the 1987 FA Cup, which uh, has softened the blow a little bit. I think uh, in in the recent years, they have sort of been promoted through the playoffs and things like that because they're now obviously back in the championship. So it's not been such a bad few recent years for Coventry supporters but certainly for a, for a long while there it was a very very barren run the FA Cup notwithstanding so uh, thanks very much to Alex for that. Yeah I've always thought Coventry were a, a, a team that seemed to be stuck in the same place for, forever I know they are like mm-hmm. you said they're back in championship now but for years they just seemed to be mid-table in whatever league they were in for so long but and I also agree that they're a really 90s club so uh they could maybe be the unofficial club of the pod, but um, I don't. I wouldn't mind it. that. I wouldn't mind that. I mean, they've got some. Uh, they had some players back then, which who I really admired, uh, who went on to become Villa legends in some cases, like George Boateng and Dion Dublin. So uh, mm. yeah, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not averse to that. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Put, we're going to put that in. I'm going to write that down. That's going in the ledger. Official uh, football club of the pod is Coventry City. We, do we have to get Jeff involved again, or is that uh, just decide that he, for ourselves? He, um, he'll check that. If yeah, if okay. it turns out we can't do that, and they're already the official club of some other pod, then we'll edit this out. So 
yeah okay no worries if you're hearing this it's a okay cool um but that um yes that's good and i do have a bit of correspondence myself as well uh and this is actually really nice correspondence this is not that that wasn't um from Alex <laughs> Web, but, um this is especially nice this is um from friend of the pod kate pro who sent me this today um and it's the first it's the first ever whatsapp voice message that i've ever had for for the pod um cool. so it was it was a, a long eloquent and um heartfelt message covering lots of uh, lots of areas of the pod actually so i've written some uh, some bullet points i'm going to go through some of it i'm not going to read out because uh, it was uh, inappropriate for various reasons <laughs> um but uh the first thing was that she agreed with mole that street fighter 2 was the best game of the 90s um but she also referenced super frog i don't know if you ever played super frog but uh me no and my brother played it quite a lot <sighs> I was trying not to, to mention my brother, but there he's, he's got a little mention there. <laughs> there he is. But we, there we did is. used to, we played this uh, a lot and it is a great platform game. So I totally agree with, with you on that, Kate. Um, and she, but she also said that she was desperate to play Carmen Santiago based on your review of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, she said game. that she was disappointed that you've given it to one of your friends or you had given it to one of your friends because <laughs> she wants to play it. So if anyone ever sees a copy of that, then send it my way and I'll pass it on. Um, she oh she and she asked for a bit of help because she was trying to identify a game that she couldn't work out what it was and okay. i can't i mean the, how she phrased it was quite confusing but she said it was a game that wasn't a computer game but it was like a video within a game which doesn't make sense um but it's it's like it was his early to mid 90s when we were at primary school so very old school and it involved a scary man who was possibly wearing a knight's costume and it sounds like a sort of maybe choose your own adventure sort of game, like a very right. basic BBC. Um, so I, all we can really go off there is it was a video within like a video program or something. And it was a scary man, maybe in a, in a night costume. Um, that's all we got to. If anyone knows what on earth Kate Pro is thinking of there, then let us know. Yeah, please do. Um, that's, a, that's a stumper. She also said a couple more things. Uh, oh, she referring to the advert one we did on, um, yeah, 90s advert. She said her and her friends back in the day would ring up Safe Style, <clears throat> ring up Safe Style, uh, and ask them to or plead with them to stop the man from singing the Safe Style man. <laughs> so there must have been an advert where he sang. I don't remember. That. I remember he <laughs> shouted a lot, but maybe he sang yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she also asked me to said she, she wanted to know what my my work experience story was because I referenced it, I think in the Will Hodgson episode. Um, just I'll just say that it's not a particularly exciting story, but it might come up at some point in the future. It's, but like I said, it's not exciting. It's just sad, really. Um, and the last thing she said was she really likes the podcast because it's like having a chat with your mates. So oh, that's brilliant. thank you very much, Kate. That was really nice to have, you know, like a, a nice sort of overview of the stuff we've done so far. I think she said she's only she's halfway through the Will Hodgson episode, Hodgson episode. So there's, there's still plenty more for you to get through there, Kate. And uh, yeah, we hope you enjoy it. Brilliant. No, thank you very much. If anybody else wants to uh, get in touch with a, with a roundup of correspondence, if they've listened to a batch of episodes, then uh, no, please do let us know. And we'll have to add your work experience story to the litany of things that, that we need to get back to un- to unpack about yourself uh, yeah. that, that, that you've sort of alluded to. Was was there one was there one that you weren't allowed to watch CITV is that we still haven't we still haven't got, got <laughs> yeah, to? Wasn't a, yeah, it wasn't that. Again, not not an exciting story by any means. <laughs> just an element of my childhood that's all to come that's all to come maybe in the christmas episode we'll get around to it who knows yeah 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 (laughs) right so um stew has already mentioned it but we do have a a new feature relatively new feature called uh what's the most 90s we've already done um football clubs and as as mentioned we we trumped for wimbledon with uh runners up as commentary city Mm -hmm. uh stew i think you've taken lead on it this time yeah so um I wanted to ask you what you thought the most 90s fashion accessory was. Now, this is not an area that we've touched upon a great deal in, in the pod. We normally talk about uh, uh, normally talk about sport and, and media and things like that. So fashion isn't really something we've spoken about. And I was just wondering, yeah, what do you think the most 90s fashion accessory is? Well, yeah, it's a good question. And it's interesting because I don't know if you've noticed, but 90s fashion is making a big comeback uh, amongst mm-hmm. the youth of uh, of today. So there are a couple of things that I was, you know, kind of runners up, um, which would were um, bucket hats. I think they've made a, a massive comeback, but they, they yeah. maybe span also into the 80s as well. 
Um, uh-huh. So not not so truly 90s. Um, the big one, the first thing that came to my head was obviously bum bags. But they are they are so ubiquitous amongst uh, young men now. Um, God, nothing makes you sound old other than referring to other people as young men. <laughs> um, I've come of age just by saying that. Um, yeah, that's it. But, that's when you tipped over into uh, yeah into middle age. Um, well, it's good that we caught we actually captured that moment on yeah, the pod. Yeah, there you go. It's this there for posterity and on a nineties yeah. nostalgia podcast as well. I mean, how how much how perfect can it get? You know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I had to discount bum bags really because of that. Well, I didn't have to discount it because it's clearly a nineties throwback. But they are worn differently now. They're worn diagonally across the torso, whereas back yes. in our day they were worn around the waist where where they should be. Um, <laughs> So the one what I have trumped for is uh, wrap around sunglasses, specifically the, the the kind that were worn by Andre Agassi in early nineties Wimbledon um, appearances. So kind of like ski glasses, basically, with ideally with a day glow fluorescent frame, and that sort of kind of I don't know how to describe it that that reflective surface that kind of catches catches yeah. a rainbow um, effect. Uh, so that is basically wrap around glasses. You can also you can think of wrap around glasses that worn by sort of pop punk and new metal guys in the, in the very late nineties, the mm-hmm. sort of oval alien style ones. So that's what I'm going to go for. Wrap around sunglasses. I think. Did you have any thoughts? Yeah, uh, I did think about. I mean, listen, I, I don't want I don't want to pull the uh, I don't want to pull the the tone down, but did did you have shag bands when you were at school was that a thing uh we uh we i'm not sure if we did i, I remember hearing about them i think they might have been one or two years below us or after us okay yeah well that would make sense with our with our ages being uh, yeah. slightly apart as they are but um yeah so these were the friendship bands i think they're just called friendship bands but but mm. certainly in my in my school um like if you if you broke somebody's uh, band that meant that you were uh, were going to uh go off and do the deed and so um <laughs> yeah i wonder if that ever I mean, actually happened i i shouldn't think so i shouldn't think so it was uh obviously a very um yeah just just a playground thing i think um mm. and also when uh when the spice girls obviously became very very big and we will be doing an episode on girl power i'm sure in the new year we've been talking about this for ages yeah. um platform shoes had a, a brief a brief comeback That's did they true. not yeah, with, uh, yeah, yeah yeah i remember the um i remember the the market in the methew and arms car park at caution the um oh yeah, yeah the yeah. guy the guy with the shoe store had some had some um had some platform shoes around about that time so yeah. um so yeah i would have gone i'm gonna go with friendship bands you might have to edit edit uh, me saying shag out i've said it again there but i've got to tell you um it makes me very uncomfortable um <laughs> and um and uh, platform shoes yeah that's what i would have gone for okay good choices so we'll go we'll go for platform shoes uh friendship bracelets and uh wrap around sunglasses i can friendship bracelets that's see that's what i should have said in the first place but hey we're doing things on the fly here you know (laughs) also do you think you you quite rightly say bucket hats bum bags making a comeback Mm -hmm. is it any coincidence that this all seems to have happened since wessex's premier 90s nostalgia podcast hit the airwaves that is so true actually i never that never occurred to me I mean, hey, you know. Ah, oh, well, that feels that's a, a, a joyous thought to uh, end that feature on. Um, I think we can take credit for that. I think we can take yeah. full credit for it. Right. So we are now into the main body of the pod. Uh, and today's topic is uh, our cult 11, our cult football 11. Yes. And we are because we think this is probably quite a, a big topic for us and we can we could probably bang on about it for ages. We're actually going to split it in two, aren't we? So we're going to do just our def- goalkeeper and defence yes. uh, yep. this time. And then we're going to do the, we'll do the second bit, the, 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 uh, the midfielders and the attackers, I think after Christmas, because we, the way the calendar is panning out, we're going to get a Christmas special in next and then that'll take us up to Christmas. So the next episode will be sometime after Christmas. Um, if, 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 yeah, just so you don't get confused when you only see the first half. Um, has our, has our um, special guest for the Christmas episode agreed? Have we, do, do, we have his, do we have it in writing? <laughs> I, don't we... want to men- I don't want to mention his name because he's a pod legend. And I think that, I think that the airwaves will go, you know, the socials and everything will go crazy when, when, when we reveal who our Christmas guest is going to be. Um, um, so I'm just interested to know if, if we've definitely got him. 
we we have he he reluctantly agreed and i say reluctantly not because he didn't think it was worth his time but only because he was he didn't think he was worthy of it um so i had to convince him but let's let's not say the name yet let's let's keep it uh yeah keep yeah. it a surprise but um, and also if he's worried about that get him to listen to the episode with my dad and he'll realize that he's got nothing to worry about at all <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um but yeah it, it, i think we're good to go for that um and that's yeah it's going to be cool. a, a good fun record when we do that um yes so. anyway we digress sorry we digress. yes yeah how how easy did you find it to come up with your your cult players um, quite easy in some positions and in others i i had to think about it um I should tell, I should ask what formation have you gone for? I've gone for a I've gone for a standard four four two, which I think yeah. is a which I think is a very you know I mean talking about Villa, they did play famously with the they played three five two in the in the sort of mid to late nineties under Brian Little when they were very successful. But I have gone with the standard four four two just because it gives me a chance to um to fill each standard position. Yeah, you know, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. That's right. So we can we can actually face our teams against each yeah. other, and it'll be like for like. That's yeah, good. Yeah. All right. When, exactly. when we made the graphics up, fantastic. <laughs> um. So yeah, do you, do you want to explain kind of what you meant by because this was your idea, um, what you mean by a cult cult footballer? Well, I think uh, I think the definition of a cult footballer. I mean, it, it can be it can be for any reason. It can be or, or many reasons, I should say. It can be a player who shined brightly uh, for a very brief time and then totally disappeared it can be a player who played 600 games and didn't score a goal or scored one goal it can be uh, you know a, a devoted reserve who devoted his career to a club and uh, I've got pretty much one of each of these um, it can be you know players who maybe went on after their career to um, to, to do something very very different from football and just just players that are, that are notable for Notable for different reasons, I, I would say, is a definition of a cult footballer. Although, I think where our teams might differ is that I have stuck, I have stuck with the Premier League in the nineties, and I think you may have gone. I think you've gone world football, haven't you? I have very much. Yeah. I don't really have any Premier League footballers here, so uh, well, that, that listen, that's, that's nice absolutely way, yeah. fine. So that yeah. that sets it up brilliantly. We've got the Premier League nineties cult eleven managed by myself yeah. versus the world football nineties cult eleven managed by yourself, and. Uh, yeah. It's a mouth-watering clash, wouldn't you agree? Oh, I, yeah, I, I, I think so. <laughs> Would you like to go first? I, I guess with your goalkeeper. We'll start with the number ones, yeah. And as you know, I'm a goalkeeper myself. I could talk for hours about goalkeepers in the 90s, and I hope that we'll, uh, and I would demand actually, uh, with, with Jeff in my contract, that we will we'll do an episode on goalkeepers in the 90s at some point. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there are so many uh, I, I could have spoken about my personal hero, uh, Mark Bosnich, people like Steve Grizovich, Mark Crossley, Kevin Pressman, um, all people like that. But the goalkeeper I've gone for is Raymond van der Hau. Um, and I think he's notable because I think he's pro- possibly the most noted and famous reserve goalkeeper of the 90s. Mm. Um, so if you don't know about Raymond van der Hau, uh, he was the backup to Peter Schmeichel at Manchester United from 1996 until 2002. Uh, in that time, he played 37 games in the, so that's six or seven seasons, I think. But he was trusted by Sir Alex Ferguson as a dependable backup whenever Peter Schmeichel was injured and uh, or, or unavailable. And at no other time was that trust, uh, was that trust tested than when Peter Schmeichel pulled out injured of the Champions League semi-final uh, against Borussia Dortmund minutes before uh, minutes before the kickoff, and Raymond van der Haar had to step in. Now Man United did lose the game, but he did a lot to um, he did a lot to keep the score down and did a lot to keep Man United in the tie. Um, also, I think I, I wanted to include him because even though it's Man United, I'm not a Man United supporter, but you know I may. Uh, I'm an aficionado of kits, and the um, I'm sure you'll know it when, I'm, when I say, but the sort of purple and pink Manchester United goalkeeper shirt of that time, mm, um, yeah, I think it, the, the sharp sponsored one. That's yeah. one of my favourite goalkeeper shirts. It came up the other day on my preferred site. Uh, I decided to go back and buy it, but by the time I'd done that, somebody else had snapped it. Up, oh so, yeah. no! You snooze, you lose. I'm afraid. Yeah. But um, 
Yeah, and just just another fact about Raymond. He played on back in uh, back in Holland after he'd left England until he was 44 years old, and he scored his only career goal in his final game uh, uh. when he just before he retired. So so that's a lovely a lovely end to um, to a brilliant career. But yeah, I think the um, the reserve goalkeeper is is obviously somebody who you know you, you definitely you definitely need somebody who's reliable and who's going to be there. When you need him, because it's a specialised position, and you need somebody you can trust. And I think for the best team in the country at the time to have somebody in that position for so many years, I think was as important as having somebody like Peter Schmeichel as your number one. Um, so yeah, I've gone with Raymond Van der Haar as, as my goalkeeper for my Premier League cult eleven. Very nice, very nice. that's a perfect choice. I think. Um, just to clarify, what number should a second choice goalkeeper be? It should definitely be 13. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you yeah. Very Re- much. Reserve goalkeeper, 13. Obviously, first choice, one. Reserve keeper, 13. And then my preferred choice for a third uh, third choice goalkeeper is either 25 or 33. But that's 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 personal to me, you know. But yeah. de- definitely 13 for reserve, yes. Yeah. That's something we actually feel quite strongly about on the pod. And we will we will actually not accept any alternatives to that. So that's right. So if you send yeah. in any messages yeah, about that, we, they won't get read out. Um, please, please be careful when picking your own eleven and and, and dishing out the squad numbers. Please, please yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, Van der Hout, I now I'm picturing someone who I know isn't the right person. What? Who was the name of? I mean, what was the name of the Chelsea goalkeeper for a bit? Who I think was also Dutch and had a moustache. He maybe played somewhere else apart from Chelsea. Uh, you're thinking of Ed de Hoy. Ed de Hoy. That's that's who I'm thinking yes. of. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, he, another nineties keeper. But I think yeah, yours yours made a lot more a lot more sense, and uh, I'm sure a bit <laughs> of a club legend for for Man United fans. I think so. It says here as well that he actually had one season at West Ham after he left Man United, but he didn't play. So um, so can I'm he, not sure he. Couldn't even get a game there. <laughs> I'm not sure he's as much of a legend at West Ham as he is at, at Man United, but uh, yeah, no, a solid uh, solid solid base for the for the team. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well, my choice, I should say to start off with, I I didn't include George Campos or Jorge Campos in my thinking because I thought it was too obvious he is the unofficial goalkeeper of the pod. Mm-hmm. I think he's actually the unofficial footballer of the pod. So I couldn't, I just sort of kept, I thought he was like too, too above all of this and <laughs> he'd be too, yeah, I just couldn't include him. But I have gone for a another another keeper from that part of the world. And this this may have come into your head. I know when I put this to to our listeners, this name did come up. Um, and it's Jose Luis Chilavert. Oh, of the, course. The 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 bulldog, as he was nicknamed. Uh, was a Paraguayan goalkeeper who um, most famously scored lots and lots of goals. So yes. unlike uh, Van der Hau, he didn't only score one at the end of his career. He actually scored forty six goals in his career. Um, Almost all of them from, well, I think probably all of them were from set pieces. I think he took penalties, but most famously took a cracking free kick. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's, yeah, he's one of only two keepers to ever score a hat trick. I mean, that's that's brilliant. <laughs> the idea of the goalkeeper scoring a hat trick is just fantastic, and he he did it. Mm-hmm. Um, he's actually only the second highest goal, second highest goal scoring keeper of all time. Um, I'll ask you. I'm not sure if you'll know. I'd never heard of this person, but do you know who the number one is? Actually, you're a I've... goalkeeping person, so you should know. I think I might know. I think he's Brazilian, mm. and I think his name is Rogério Sini. Exactly, exactly who it is. Yeah. So, um, Silvera scored forty-six goals. Uh, Sini or Sini scored one hundred and three, <laughs> more than twice <laughs> I mean, as many. That's that uh, is that's amazing. That I, is unbelievable. Yeah, I think he's he's only recently retired, or might even still be playing. I think uh, Rogério uh, Cheni. He definitely um, played into his forties. Uh, I think he's one of these ones that, that went went on and on. So um, it's possible he's still going to be playing. We'll have to check that out. Yeah. So um, I, yeah, I've t- chosen Chilava just because of that that sort of odd oddness of of being a goal scoring goalkeeper. Um, he's one of those players you just sort of become aware of because I don't think he ever played in. Um, Europe. He maybe played in. I think he did play in. Oh, he played for Strasbourg actually in France. Now that I think about it, mm-hmm. but that's it. Obviously, not a big, big name in European football. But we never would have really seen him much on TV apart from if England played Paraguay or one of the other home nations played Paraguay. But you sort of just become aware of him because he's such a, an anomaly in, in the world of goalkeepers. So um, I like that as well. I like it as someone who comes from a, a, a more unusual uh, national country. Um, 
like Paraguay. I mean, I would love to see more of Paraguay on the world stage. I don't know about you. I think the last time they were at the World Cup was maybe 2002. Well, I think maybe they were at 98. Were they at 98? I think they were, but they were in England's group in 2006. Uh, I think yes. I think that was England's first game, and I, I yes. don't think, I, but I don't think they've been back since. No. No, we need more of Paraguay, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, Shilavel obviously is retired now, so we wouldn't see him. But um, yeah, that's that's my choice. My, my Brilliant my choice number one, Shilavel. Uh, I can clearly remember, well, my, my introduction to the world of Chilevert was one of two moments. I, I can't remember which one came first, but it was either there was a big long segment of his free kicks and goals and stuff in Nick Hancock's Football Nightmares, the the, the, the VHS uh, compilation, sort of own goals and gaffes type thing, although obviously own goals and gaffes with Danny Baker is the is the standard by which all others are judged. Um it was either that or I remember from the 98 World Cup watching Paraguay versus France in the second round. And he, he hit the he hit the bar with a free kick. Oh, and okay. if he'd scored, he would have been the first goalkeeper to ever score in a World Cup. And I, I still I don't think it's actually been done still. Um, okay, so, yeah. so I remember that happening because the commentator was saying if he scores this, this is this is a historic moment yeah, yeah. sort of thing. Um, but yeah, Shilavé. And, and this is something that sadly... Sadly, lacking, I think, in uh, in modern goalkeepers, you might get the odd uh, the odd thing with like uh, Allison uh, scored a header, didn't he, of, of, uh, last season mm. for, for Liverpool and things like that. But yeah. but that's that's with a goalkeeper going up for a corner. Um, I think the the set piece taking goalkeeper is a uh, is a dying art, and we're we're worse off for it. Trust yeah. me. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, who is your your first defender? Right, well, I'm going to go across the back four. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll go in number order. So so in the number two shirt, right back, um, I've gone with Des Little. Oh, do, you yes. know, nice. do you know anything yeah. about Des Little? Um, actually, no, I don't. I When you said that, I was thinking Des Walker. No, I don't know anything about Des Little. Okay, no. so, so Des Little was uh, Nottingham Forest's first choice right back throughout, throughout the bulk of the 90s. Um, and the reason I want to pick him, there's two reasons. First of all, is that I always, whenever I was doing a sticker album, always seemed to end up with loads of spare Des Littles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I seem to remember having having piles of Des Littles that I couldn't have swapped with anybody. Um, and secondly, again, going back to Nick Hancock's Football Nightmares, I'm fairly sure on that tape he scores a fantastic headed own goal. Um, <laughs> and obviously, I, I used to I used to watch those things over and over again, like wearing out the tapes. Yeah. Um, so so I'm I'm very very. Uh, very very reminiscent on that goal also um wearing the the fantastic yellow uh away Notts forest sorry i have to stop myself there nine and forest fans don't like it if you call them Notts forest so apologies to, uh, to forest fans out there that was a, that was an aberration yeah. i shall just i shall simply refer to as forest from now on um they had a lovely yellow away kit with the labats sponsorship mm. which um w- which is fantastic um also he pretty much finished his playing career quite locally uh, down here at Forest Green Rovers. So, wow. um, yeah, and a, a friend of mine, a chap called Scott Windle, who who used to play in goal for, for Caution Town, he was uh, an apprentice at, at Forest Green at the time and, and played played a few games with with Des Little himself. So, uh, so yeah, in, in the right-back position, very, very dependable player. Uh, three goals in 185 games from right-back throughout the 90s. Uh, and, yeah, that's Des Little in the, in the right-back position. Nice. Does he only play for clubs, or did he only play for clubs that have Forest in the name? <laughs> um, let's have a look. He's got, well, he's got, he's got two Forests here. Um, I mean, he played for West Brom. They've got a um, they've got a tree on their badge, haven't they, with the throstle? Yeah, I think. they play at the Hawthorns, don't they? That's yeah, that's a, right. That's a type of tree. That's right. A small, a short spell at Stourport Swifts as well. It says here. So there's, you know, hmm. there's a, the, the links are there. The links are there. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Do you think with the stickers, um, football stickers, they they do print an an equal amount of all the stickers, or do you think some players do get more and they're just like the lower value ones? I th- I yeah I do think I do think they print different uh, different amounts of different players because they've they've got to make it harder you know quite a job to complete the album I suppose don't they I mean I remember I was I'll never forget his name Dimitri Paloz uh, who plays for played up front for Russia, uh, 2018 World Cup. I was 
grubbing around for a Dimitri Paloz sticker, and I couldn't couldn't find one for love nor money. I I ended up actually buying one from Panini because I couldn't do it in the uh, I couldn't do it in the uh, in the in the time honoured manner of sort of swapping and everything. I mean, you know, a thirty two year old man joining Facebook groups for <laughs> Panini swaps is um it's probably not the way to go really. But there you go. Yeah. And I've, I've I've got that completed album. So the bees, you've got my number. <laughs> Yeah, they're worth something. Like you completed uh, sticker annuals from back in the day. So uh, back in the day, they are uh, yes. But uh, right now, a 2018 completed World Cup album is probably worth less than the amount I spent on the stickers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <That's laughs> so you're right. When yeah. I, when I say keep hold of it, I mean keep hold of it for 20, 30 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. An appreciating classic. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, who's your? Should we go for your right back as well? Yeah, I realise I've actually, I think I've got three centre backs and one left back. So I'm sure one of these guys can play right back as well. I'm going to choose this person to to do that, to play that role. Because uh, I consider them to a little bit more um, solid centre backs. Um, And it's Alessandro Costa-Curta, who I've chosen solely because when I think of back in the day, who seemed like a sort of, exotic European footballer and t- t- my my taste of exotic European football came almost solely from Football Italia mm-hmm. um, the, the, the the great classic 90s football program uh, presented by James Richardson I think yep. that's his name yeah um, and Costa Curta to me just in his Milan shirt because he spent over 20 years at Milan I think that was the only club he ever played for apart from a, a brief loan spell with uh, Modena I think it was so he was very much a died in a war Milan player. And that I think AC Milan also, along with maybe Sampdoria, maybe Fiorentina, are the football Italia clubs, I think, for me. I guess the AC Milan shirt is, is such a legendary shirt. So I think mm-hmm. it costs to play for AC Milan, just the most 90, early 90s football I could think of. Um, but he's, he's, I mean, he was a legend as well, it seems. Uh He, seven Serie A titles, five Champions League, champion... Champions Leagues, Champions Leagues. That sounds weird to say plural. Yeah, no, it uh, does. And, You're right. Um, and and European Cups. I mean, I think around that time was when it crossed over to the Champions League. Um, and he played for Italy in the World Cup '94 and '98. Um, so he's, I mean, highly decorated. And in 2015, the Telegraph included him in, in I think, at number two in their list of the top 20 most underrated footballers of all time. So. I like that as well. It's always always yeah. nice to have an, an underrated footballer, and if they're underrated, to give him a bit of a shout out. So I'm sure he'll be be glad to know that I've put him in this in this team. Um, so this is for you, Alessandro. Uh, finally, a bit more recognition. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. As long as he's right footed, do, do, do you think? Do you do you do you think he might um, he might fall out with the management of being shoehorned in at right back? Or uh... um, he might do. I think. I mean, he's obviously very loyal to his club, but unfortunately, that hmm. club is AC Milan, not not my club. <laughs> but if he's in the club, if he's in my team, I'm sure I'll um, give it 100. percent Yeah, I was going to go yeah. and look it up and work to see what foot he was, but um, he's going to play to my rules. Right? <laughs> he'll have to just he'll just have to cut inside if he has to. <laughs> okay, I'm sure he can do a job. It, um, when I think of Costa Curta, I think of uh, the episode of Father Ted where they think Father Jack's died. Uh, oh, yeah. I don't know if you've seen this, and um, I must have done. Father Dougal's reading in the last rites, and he just um, <laughs> he just says a load of like surnames of Italian players from <laughs> Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Donadini, oh, Costa Curta, Baggio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, very yeah, funny. Yeah. Uh, taught us to us a minimus canis Costa Curta Baggio Roberto. <laughs> Right, are you All going right. to go to your centre backs or your left back? Which way are you going to go? I'll go. I'll go. For, I'll go. I'll keep it in number order. I'll go for number three, and I'll go to the left back. Now, okay. I am willing to put my mortgage on the fact that you will not have heard of this player. Okay. So I hope you haven't heard of him, because then I'll owe you my mortgage. Uh, I've gone See, for, yeah, to be honest, more... that's the only way I'm going to get on the housing ladder. It's to win <laughs> something like this. <laughs> I've gone for a player called Frank Yallop. No, I've not heard of him. No, keep why didn't, why didn't you lie? <laughs> you know, now that you say that, as soon as I said those words, I thought I should have. Uh, I could have had a house out of that lie. <laughs> I'm too honest. Ah, oh, dear, oh dear. Okay, so yeah, Frank Yallop, uh, Canadian international, 
389 games and nine goals for Ipswich Town between 1983 oh, and 1996. I'm sorry, I know it's your great rivals. Um, but the reason I've picked Frank Yallop is because, again, I'm going back to, to football VHSs and I used, to, I used to get them sort of about, you know, two or three years out of date. I'd, I'd see them in, in charity shops and things like that and anything that, would, that was football and particularly like uh, goal compilations, things like that. I had one called Five. 502 great goals um but the one that i watched over and over again was one called goals 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 and that is a compilation of 101 from the first season of the premier league so it's the first sky season um 92-93 and oh, funnily i worked this out the last time i watched it which was a couple of years back um the famous dalian atkinson goal for villa against wimbledon where he runs through the entire team, and then the bloke comes on with the umbrella. You must know the one. Yeah. It's not on there. What? And it's taken, you know, I've watched this hundreds <laughs> of times over the years. Just hang on a minute. The, the best goal of that season is, isn't on here, and I can't understand why, because there's loads of other, like, worse Daly and Atkinson goals on there. Yeah. But um, maybe the, the, best, the, the right. best one of all isn't there. So, yeah, maybe they didn't have the rights, because the, the rights were owned by BBC's uh, Goal of the Season or something. And maybe, maybe. I don't know. I'll have to, <laughs> to try and look into that further. I don't know. Anyway, um, Frank Gallup is on uh, the Goals, Goals, Goals compilation. Uh, he scored the winner in a 2-1 win for Ipswich over the uh, title contenders at the time, Manchester United, uh, steaming up the pitch from left back to uh, to score the goal. And uh, I didn't know this. I didn't know this sort of background of the game because obviously it's, it's a clip taken out of context. But um, uh, his Wikipedia says uh, the result, the 2-1 win over Manchester United at Portman Road, saw Ipswich occupy fourth place in the league and spark hopes of a late run to the title. And this is in late February 93. OK, so there's two months of the season to go. Mm. Uh, instead, a slump in form followed and they finished 16th. Now, <laughs> <laughs> that has to have been a hell of a slump. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to oh, finish uh, to finish in 16th from 4th at the end of February <laughs> um, but most memorable and maybe we can drop it in here if we can find it but uh, I'll, I'll always remember the commentator saying over the replay and it doesn't quite work which is why it always um, which is why it always stuck with me and it's Wallop from Yallop <laughs> <laughs> oh I love a, a slightly well thought out commentary <laughs> uh, gaff. East Anglia goes wild Dazelle with the flick out for Frank Yellop and Wallop from Yellop. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, so yeah, ju just for that, just for that one goal on that compilation, I'm not aware of, of anything else really he did in his career. Um, but yeah, I'll go for Frank Yellop. I suppose having a Canadian in the Premier League, would he have been playing alongside Craig Forrest at that time as well? The the other Canadian in the Premier League, I suppose he would have done. They're both Ipswich yeah, players. I guess so. Yeah. Well, I like I, I do like a, a Canadian footballer. Uh, got a soft mm. spot for them. We, we had one, one at Norwich called Simeon Jackson, who was a bit of a legend for the short time he was there. So yeah, um, always got time for Canadian. So good choice. Same yeah. about the Ipswich thing, but no, I'm sorry, mate. Okay. You know it happens. That's all right. Um, I've got seven uh, West Brom players here, so. Um, <laughs> my left back is a particularly hard man uh in in the truest sense of the word he is sinisa mihailovic uh -huh. um the serbian or previously yugoslavian defender and briefly defensive midfielder earlier in his career who played at left back before playing uh, a more central role but he was i mean i think a lot of people will will know his name he he played for in, in the Serie A for most of his career mm -hmm. um or for, certainly when he was at his peak uh, for Lazio and he i've chosen him kind of a little bit similar to um Schilleve, really in that he is a goal scoring defensive player so i know there's lots of defenders that score goals but he he scored a lot of, of goals uh with his free kicks and he's he's known as one of the greatest free kick takers of of his day I always thought that was cool. A defender who's got a really cultured uh, free kick, you know. He, he, some uh, defenders obviously take, you know, real pile driver um, free kicks like Alex from Chelsea. Um, mm -hmm. but I think Mihailovic was a bit more cultured. And he, he was uh, with his with his left foot, so I really like that. He was a real legend at Red Star Belgrade. He um, often uh, 
was involved in uh, quite full on confrontations on the pitch in uh, <laughs> in the Serbian leagues as well as in in, in Italy. Um, he actually holds the, mo- the record for the most goals from free kicks in Serie A at 28, uh, and he once scored a hat trick of free kicks, which is uh, very cool. He he's co- I'm conflicted to be honest because. As cool as I think that is, he is one of the dirtiest players of, of all time. <laughs> and worse than that, really, his his politics were highly or are highly questionable. Uh, he's got he's a, a real a strong Serbian nationalist, uh, which I have no issue with. But um, he also uh, has been involved in in racial ab- abuse. He racially abused Patrick Vieira um, during a match against Arsenal. Apparently they've they they both made up later on, but you know it doesn't make it any better. So I'm not putting him in this team because he's one of my favourites, but I am sort of fascinated by him. I think he's mm-hmm. he represents uh, uh, an interesting uh, part of 90s football, and yeah, I I've yeah I always remember him standing out and sort of looking to get a a glance at him if he was ever playing in the Champions League on ITV on a Wednesday night or something. <laughs> but um, yeah, so Mihailovic, uh, a, a dirty player, but um, He's in there at left back, so you better watch okay. out. So there's the grit in your team then. Yeah. Uh, did he score? Did he score a free kick in the '98 World Cup, possibly against Germany? Um, I like wouldn't I... be surprised. Yeah, uh, I'm fairly sure he did. Yeah, because Yugoslavia were involved in that thriller against Spain, which I think was four all. So he. That's right. It's four three or four all, something four, like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember. Yeah. So yeah, he was probably playing in that game. I don't know if he scored a free kick, but um. I'm sure he would have scored a free kick in some international tournament that we would have watched um, with that record. So, um, okay. what's, who's your, your first centre back? Well, I'll, uh, I'm going to have to skip to number five because I want to quite rightly keep number four for uh, for one of my central midfielders. Yeah. So, uh, so, so we'll move on from, uh, from we'll leave number four and we'll go to number five. And I have to say, with with my next two choices, I am beginning to slightly worry for my side lining up against yours. <laughs> um, I've gone for my first centre half is uh, is a guy called Carl Tyler. Again, I'm not I'm not sure that, that you, you might have even heard of uh, Carl Tyler. Um, <laughs> he's uh, he's a Villa legend, the first first Villa legend in the team. Uh, only played 12 games for Villa, um, and the reason I wanted to include him is because he ruptured his hamstring on his debut for Villa against Everton in uh, in 1995. And he didn't come back from that for 10 months. Um, and it just got me thinking that back in those in, in those times, if you got an injury like that, or even worse, something like a something like a cruciate or or, or a leg break, you were out for 10 months to a year. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. See, it seemed to happen all the time. Mm. Like I remember Alan Shearer being out for a very got injured in a preseason tournament, I think, and he was out injured for a very long time. Nowadays, I was trying to think like the the closest thing that I could I could relate to this, and I think sort of Virgil Van Dyke's injury of last season, which kept him out for kept him out mm. for for a very long time, but still, I don't think as long as ten months. No. Um, and it has to be a good thing that the advances in obviously the way that the way that footballers are looked after and advances in medical technology mean that you're not you don't lose ten months of your career if you uh, you know if you rupture a hamstring or or, or get quite a serious injury. Yeah, um, that's true. I also wanted to mention Carl Tyler for his part in a Aston Villa club video called Squaddies, uh, which which is available on YouTube. Now this has been covered in depth on on other podcasts, so I don't I don't want to uh, I don't want to go into it too deeply because uh, because they've done it far better than I ever could. But um, it's one of these things where they go through the players, and it's essentially. Do you remember, like in match day programs, sometimes you get the uh, the sort of focus on a player and it'd be what car do you drive, what's your favourite drink, all this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's this, but with the whole Aston Villa squad in video form. Oh, so nice. they're all sat there with they're getting their answering these questions. And um, Carl Tyler, again, we'll, we'll, we'll put some of it in if we can. Um, he is heroically boring in, uh, <laughs> in, in all of his answers. Um, yeah. Like, you know, favourite drink. Well, I, I enjoy to lager on a on a Friday night like a, like everybody else and all this sort of thing you know uh, I'm not sure I've got that totally right but he was just um, you know an ordinary bloke from the Midlands playing football um, and uh, and I've got a lot I've had a lot of time for Carl Tyler for that so Italians I like Italians Chinese and uh, that's basically it. that's all I eat really 
he did he did re- go on to recover from that injury. He didn't play a lot for Villa, but he did go on and play in the Premier League again for Everton and, and Charlton Athletic later on. So um, so he did play quite a few games in the Premier League. And uh, yeah, tough tackling centre half when he's fit. So uh, my first choice is yeah, Carl Tyler. Nice. Very nice. Uh, yeah, I, I do hope he stays fit. Um, that's a really, yeah, it's an interesting point you make about uh, how, how long people would be out for back then and, and how much quicker people would come back now, which is can only be a good thing. I, I, there's almost everything I can feel nostalgia for if it was mm-hmm. in the 90s, but players being out for a long time, I can give that up. I, I yeah, yeah. Sacrificing that for... Nobody wants that. Quicker <laughs> no. Um, okay, yeah, I am stu- I am also starting to fear for your team a little bit here because um, <laughs> my um, my first centre back is Aldair Nascimento dos Santos, uh, known simply as Aldair, who was a Brazilian centre back, played from 1985 to 2010. Uh, I've chosen him. This is kind of just a personal choice, really. In that he, I just thought he was a very cool player all round. He's the sort of centre back I like. He's kind of tall and rangy. But kind of tough and hard, but but mm. not dirty. Like he wasn't, he wasn't going in looking for fights. He wasn't trying to break people's legs. He wasn't giving lots of mouth to players. He was just, he just knew what he had to do, and he did it, and he did it well, uh, and he looked really cool. And yeah, so I liked him for that. Um, he played in three ninety, all three of the nineties World Cups, including the best one of all, uh, in my opinion, ninety four, and mm-hmm. I know your favorite, ninety eight. Um, I think the 94 World Cup squad is my favourite Brazilian uh, squad of all time. So I had, you know, like Romario and Bebeto and Cafu and Aldair. Um, so I like I like him for that. Um, and he was at an absolute legend at um, Roma, I think in their coolest period in the very late 90s, early 2000s, when it was, you know, Totti, uh, Batistuta, Cafu, uh, Nakata, mm-hmm. Montella. I think it's one of the coolest European club um like phases oh without that i can think of um uh and he was there for 13 years so he was a real legend at that club um he actually had his number retired from roma number six as well like it's quite a big number to retire Mm -hmm. it's uh, apparently it's subsequently come back they've they've allowed it back to their squad with alday's approval i like that they asked alday for approval like he's the sort (laughs) of player you're not going to do something behind his back Yeah, yeah um and then he ended his career at San Marino side SS Morata, uh, <laughs> where he helped them become the first San Marinese team to play in a UEFA Champions League fixture, which unfortunately they lost uh, to Tampere United from Finland, uh, 4-1 on, on aggregate. But I, I didn't know that. And uh, it was only when I looked him up to refresh my memory that I realised he'd played for a San Marino side. Um, I thought that mm. was very cool after an already very cool career. So... Um, yeah, that's why I've got him in all those reasons. Aldair, yeah, my first centre. Great, uh, brilliant. Of course, Taffarel as well in in that wonderful mm, ninety four yeah, side. Of course. Yeah, um, yeah. It's funny that we should we should go to San Marino after. I mean, as as we uh, as we record this, listeners, England have, have beaten San Marino ten uh, nil in their last World Cup qualifier before yeah. before Qatar next year. Uh, San Marino in that wonderful kit. Mm. But um, whenever San Marino face England. There's always some media attention around a guy called uh, David Galtieri, mm. who uh, was the San Marino player who scored against England after about eight seconds yeah, in, yeah. Uh, in 1993. The San Marino kickoff. Remember that Holland on this very ground. Oh, it's a mistake by Pierce and humiliation here. Galtieri. I was going to say that San Marino conceded a goal in the. Opening seconds against Holland. Well, it's England that have conceded a goal here. Phil Thompson, can you believe it? Gualtieri is the scorer. Uh, now, 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 do you really? Yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember the setup to that match was we had to beat them by seven goals and hope that Poland beat the Netherlands, I think, or Poland beat someone. That is... Poland had to win somewhere else in the group. And I remember, yeah, we conceded really early and then we went on to win 7-1. And but right. it, didn't, it was irrelevant because Poland lost anyway. Yeah. But I remember yeah. thinking, if Poland had won and we'd lost by one goal because we'd only beaten them 7-1, <laughs> that would have been like insane to think yeah. that um, yeah, absolutely. we missed out from that. But, but uh, no, you've got that exactly right. And that, of course, all comes from the um, the whole Ronald Koeman thing when he should have been sent yes. off and he yeah, shouldn't yeah, have yeah. scored the free kick and all this sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. Anyway, that's, uh, we don't want to reopen those wounds, do we? That's, um, no. 
no, we'll leave that for another time. When we do the 94 World Cup review, uh, we need to write down all these things. Whenever we're doing these episodes and we say, oh, yeah, we'll do an episode on that. We need to we need to keep yeah, track, yeah. you know, it's true. Uh, I'm not going to forget goalkeepers of the 90s or the 94 World Cup. So that's fine. <laughs> all right. Um, so it's my final choice in the number six shirt. Uh, this guy is my captain, I've decided. Uh, and I've also gone for, it's another Dutch player, for, so I've got Raymond, obviously, uh, in goal. Uh, my uh, second centre-half alongside Carl Tyler and my captain is Ian Dezieu. Um Came into the Premier League with Barnsley in 1998 for their only Premier League season. Uh, he then played in the Premier League in two spells with Wigan and uh, also at Portsmouth, uh, over 100 games at each of those clubs as well. Um, he's a model professional. Uh, he's 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 well well renowned and respected for that. Possibly most famous in footballing terms for being uh, spat at by El Hadj Juf while playing for Wigan a bit later on, yeah. um, and he was actually commended in Parliament for the way <laughs> for the way he reacted, which was not to react at all, mm. um, and then just sort of just sort of get on with the uh, get on with the job. But um, yeah, El Hadj Juf proving again what a nice what a nice chap he is. Um, mm. But that Barnsley team of, of 97, 98, I mean, going back to what I've uh, what I've said in the past about having a, you know, having a soft spot for underdogs and things like that. I've always I've always enjoyed teams coming up to the Premier League for the first time and seeing how they get on. And I think that Barnsley was really the first time that, that I took, took notice of this. And there's a wonderful book by a German author called Ronald Reng, and it's called The Keeper of Dreams. Um, and it's about the Barnsley reserve goalkeeper, a guy called Lars Lazy, um, who and it's, it's it's about his career. But obviously, there's a big um, there's a there's a big uh, big chunk about his his time at Barnsley, which is a great book if you if you haven't read it and you're interested in in goalkeeping or football in general, I'd uh, encourage you to seek it out. But Ian Dzeu is possibly most noted for his career after he finished uh, football. He went back to Holland and he became a sort of CSI guy. He's now like a forensic, uh, oh, right. one of these forensic policemen who, uh, yeah, who yeah. does does all the uh, yeah does all the stuff uh, does all the stuff like that. So totally retrained after he finished his career um, uh, to do that. So yeah, a very very notable guy for his professionalism on the pitch and off it. Um, I love that Barnsley team in uh, in in ninety seven ninety eight, even though they were only in the Premier League briefly. Um, and yeah, that's that's my captain, and that's my my backline sorted. And I, I don't think I could, uh, I don't think I could give the responsibility to anybody who I could trust more. Yeah, no, that's very nice. Yeah, I often forget the Barnes are in the Premier League, but I, I I have a, I mean, I could probably rank every English football club in one long list of how much I like. I've got a long spectrum, you know, of where I can put each team. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, but Barnsley would be quite high up. I, I do have a soft spot for Barnsley. I'm not quite sure why, but a um, bit of a forgotten Yorkshire team, I suppose. But yeah, I forget that they're in the Premier League. So I'm glad you've given mm-hmm. a mention to one of their their squad mem- uh, members for, for that for that season. Um, and yeah, great to have a, a CSI detective mentioned as well. Um, well, there we go. I mean, I don't know if those skills could be put to use in in and around the, the um, you know, the stadium for the for the Premier League Cup nineties eleven. You know, if maybe if somebody takes somebody else's sandwiches out of the, the fridge in the canteen, you know, we yeah, can yeah. look at the prints and uh, and all that and get it sorted. I don't yeah. know. So, uh, you got to have a, a good skill set around these places, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Although I think if anyone is uh, assaulted, I think we can all just immediately assume it was Mihailovic. <laughs> um. <laughs> Carl Tyler's okay. rolling around with his hamstring. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so I guess um, Aldair must have been number six because he had that retire from Roma. So I'm mm-hmm. going back to my number five with my final centre-back choice. Uh, and this is, I'm going to say to you, what player do you think of when I say uh, green hair? <laughs> I can only be one. Yes. Cham- championship manager legend, Taribo West. It is exactly that <laughs> man, Tarevo West, a uh, Nigerian centre back, played uh, from 1989 to 2007. Um, played all over Africa, Asia, and Europe. Um, and as you say, well, as I say, green hair was his defining physical feature. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily his. Uh, uh, Would it be unfair to say it was his defining characteristic? Because uh, because he was a great player. 
uh, and he played for both Milan's. So you can't you can't be a bad player if you're playing for both of them. Uh, then went on to play for Derby County in Plymouth. So <laughs> yeah, he, I think in his peak it was the late nineties at Inter Milan. Uh, anyone who played the early ISS Pro Evolution Soccer's and and I guess FIFA of that era will will, will know him. Uh, and actually Soccer 2, which is a great PlayStation 1 mm-hmm. game, um, partly because he was the only player that had green hair in the game. Um, <laughs> so even when the players were made up of seven pixels, you know, you could still spot Taribo. And uh, I noticed this on Wikipedia because I was looking him up, uh, and it said in April 20, April 2002, Taribo West was released by FC Kaiserslautern due to their total disagreement. And that's all it says. <laughs> he, he was released by Kaiserslautern for their total disagreement. Oh, there's uh, got to be more know. to that, surely. Yeah, I don't know if that just, yeah. Just, I mean, it just it's total disagreement. So it's on everything. It's like <laughs> the, the playing style, um, the way his like, uh, shirt was hung up, the food at the canteen, Blur or Oasis, just everything <laughs> they disagreed on. Um, and he is, uh, he's now gone on to become uh, a pastor in uh, in a church that he himself founded uh, in Lagos, um, and so yeah, I've chosen him for that for that sort of '90s football game recognition. Um, everyone knows him, uh, and also I did just spot this little uh, little interesting thing at the end of his Wikipedia entry, which was uh, in 2010 it was reported that West and other Nigerian internationals such as JJ Kocha, Kanu, and Ovenbo Martins uh, were much older than they claimed to be. Uh, and in April 2013, uh, Zarko Zevic, former FK Partizan uh, general secretary, said that West is 12 years older than he claimed. <laughs> um, uh, and then shortly afterwards, apparently, West denied the accusation. And that's that's all the information I found on Tariba West's Wikipedia page. So apparently wow. lots of these Nigerian players were up to 13 years older than they claimed to be. But I don't understand that. It's just like a weird sort of conspiracy or if it's true it's just i mean that's it's not three years older or four years 13 years older they'd all yeah. be like i mean late 40s by the end of their career so you would know i think you'd sort of spot that well that's exactly it. i mean if he if we say he retired when he was 36 he's you know he's not going to be 50 is he no it's not no no i don't think that's uh, i don't think that's right either no but if they all were 10 10 12 13 years older then they're even better than we give them credit for because <laughs> they were a good side. Like I know you're in '98, we're good. If they were all mid 40s at that point doing that, then yeah, they deserve more credit. But um, hmm. uh, I don't believe in Taribo, so I'm on your side. Uh, yeah, my, my final choice. Do you have any special mentions as well that you, you that almost made the cut? Well. We've, we've mentioned him when we were briefly talking about the qualification for World Cup 94. I did almost put Ronald Koeman in uh, as as the, the second centre-half. But then I, yeah. when I thought about it a bit more, I, I went for I went for Dizou. Um, so and I've already I've already said that there's a litany of goalkeepers I could have picked. Um, so, yeah, and I, I'm looking forward to revealing the, the second half of the uh, of the team, the, the, the attacking half, which I hope will uh, be able to put your, it has to be said, very, very classy defence. Uh, under under a bit of pressure, yeah. A couple of honourable mentions were I was I wanted to put Paolo Montero in Uruguayan centre back, played for Juventus most famously. Just thought he was really cool. Similar to Alde, I didn't I couldn't think of enough to say about him. That's why I left him out. But he was very mm-hmm. cool. And I also thought about uh, Rustu for my goalkeeper. Oh yes, for, um, yeah. for just being a cool <laughs> Turkish goalkeeper who put paint under his eyelids. Um, <laughs> When he played, so they were my two honourable mentions. I do also have some. I I put this around on. Uh, I think you put it on the Facebook, and mm-hmm. I asked around. Um, and I do have some correspondence on this. Cool. I should say actually that Taribo West, I Craig, my friend Craig, uh, pointed it out to me, suggested that. Um, so I thank him for that. Listener of the pod, Mole also said Chilavere. Uh Ian Pook, listener of the pod, chose Julian Dix. The uh, the West Ham hard man, mm-hmm. um, may, mainly because he was the defender that took penalties, but also because he had such a bad disciplinary record. Uh, and apparently in 2000, he was given a testimonial match uh, and the game was marred by a 17 player brawl <laughs> in which West Ham player Igor Stimac was booked for a bad tackle. And the West Ham captain for the day, Paolo Di Canio, slapped several Spanish players in the face. <laughs> uh, and that's the testimonial. So 
Hang on, Julian Dix wasn't captain at his own testimonial. Uh, I thought that was uh, I thought that was sort of a given, wasn't it? Oh yeah, that's true. No, he wasn't. Right. He couldn't be trusted. But no, exactly. Give it to Paolo Di Canio. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> um, and Brilliant. also, uh, Ian picked Barry Venison for the hair. Um, a different Ian, Ian Devon, picked Colin Hendry again for the general mm-hmm. appearance. Uh, and Craig mentioned Dion Dublin, who you've mentioned, because he is an English football legend and he was one of those centre backs who also played centre forward. And what isn't to love about a centre back who plays centre forward? Absolutely, I think uh, not. Not to uh, not to reveal too much, but one of my centre forwards um, could also fill in at centre half when required. So uh, oh. I'll I'll reveal more about that. I'll just on just touching on Dion before we finish. Is he one of the the few players who's a legend for both of us, Villa and Norwich? Yeah. That's true. And Coventry City. And of course Coventry City. So he right, okay. So now we've got we've got Jorge Campos. I think we need to have Dion, don't we, as well as one yeah, of the um, I think we do. He's going in the ledger. He's going in a ledger. Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Write that down. He's a lawyer and scribe. So that's the the end of our defensive halves for our our Colt 11s. As as I mentioned, we'll be doing the the, the attacking halves of the squads. Uh, sometime after Christmas, so keep an eye open for that, and uh, don't forget to uh, get let us know your choices and any thoughts you have on our defensive players, any attacking players you want to put in um, that side of the squad, and uh, of course any other previous topics we've covered on the, the podcast. Uh, let us know on the usual channels: uh, Twitter at All Right Nineties, Facebook dot uh, com forward slash All Right Nineties, or you can email us at. Uh, all right 90s at gmail.com uh all letters no numbers um and yeah that's how you can contact us and please do yeah please send in your uh, your own 90s cult 11s but do remember to number them correctly otherwise we will be forced to uh delete them and, and just not read them out so please do bear that in mind yeah absolutely Okay, well, um, we will hopefully be doing a Christmas uh, episode for the next one, so uh, keep an eye open for that, and uh, there'll be plenty of uh, cheesy Christmassy sound effects um, <laughs> for you to, uh, to to enjoy. So um, come back for that one, and until then, uh, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. See you next time. Any, do you have any correspondence on this? Anyone? No, so you have no. to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs>